worry because it absolutely will be recorded. So this is our general outline. We will have a break for water and other things during that, but we're just going to go ahead and get started. And I do want to note too that when a lot of you registered, you actually included some additional information about things that you really want to learn or things that are more specific to your project. I want to let you know that some of those things are not in this workshop, but we haven't forgotten you. We're not ignoring you. There is actually some additional materials that address that and we'll uh, make those available to you at the end of the workshop. We are going to get right in. So what is data management? Now I know from the registration that some of you are experts in this area of data and data science. Some of you are beginners and so for some of you this is going to be a refresher and for some it's going to be pretty new. So what is data management? I would like to back up actually and say well what is data or what are data? Really, in a basic sense, data is just a collection of some kind of facts. So this could be a lot of different things. I think sometimes we're sort of trained to think that data is, it's just numbers in a spreadsheet, but it's actually so much more than that. And I'm actually, my background is a little bit of environmental studies, but I would say mainly humanities. So for me, data looks quite different than a spreadsheet. So we can think about numbers being data, words can be data, um, measurements, observations, descriptions. It can be so many different things. And you'll see this as we go through our activities today. All disciplines have data. So you could be in engineering, you could be in fine arts, and you could be in everything sort of in between that. You have data. So even the humanities have data. I know some folks in here are coming more from a humanities social sciences background. You absolutely have data as well in your discipline. And actually it can include more than just the data sets themselves. As you'll see in our activities today, what we, in, what we think of as data is so broad and it can include the things like code books, documentation, metadata, et cetera, that sort of accompanies our data. So we're gonna dig into that really, really heavy today. Now, okay, let's go back to what the slide is titled. What is data management then? Data management is just managing these facts, whatever data we have, so we can get the most information we can out of them, so we can extract as much information as possible. And ultimately, it helps our work have a better impact, and people can understand it better. They can use your data if you're sharing it. There's so many more things that can happen when we manage our data well. So some activities, if you think of data management as this big umbrella and there's all of these activities under it, that might include doing things like organizing, documenting, tidying. Another way you might hear that referred to is cleaning data. So if you have, you know, like a messy data set, cleaning data, um, naming things, sharing it, all of these different activities fall under the realm of data management. Why do we do it? Well, you know, in a very kind of fundamental sense, for a lot of funding agencies, it's a return on investment because they're investing this money in your project and they want to make sure that, you know, you're producing and taking care of this data that they have funded. But let's, you know, let's broaden that a little bit. It's got a, it's a public benefit. If we can make our research more accessible and translatable to wide audiences by just having everything very organized and managed, that is great public benefit. And then just, it's a benefit to science. It's, it's a benefit to us to have managed data as well as our colleagues, as well as the scientific discipline as a whole. Okay. So we're gonna jump right into skills training at this point. So I will spend a couple of minutes to preface this section we have three activities for you that you're going to be doing both some are going to be in groups some are going to be more on your own everything will have directions associated with it so i'll be i'll be telling you know how you're going to do these different activities and one thing i will say is that with some of these activities you may be looking at it and saying what does this have to do with data management I promise it has everything to do with data management. So just bear with me if you're having some of those thoughts at first of, you know, what does this have to do with anything? Because we're gonna bring it all back together and talk about how this refers to data management. 
Okay. And always, if you have questions, feel free to, to throw them in chat. Okay, so the first skill we're gonna be talking about is metadata. Putting it very, very, very simply, metadata is data about data. So if we have a data set, metadata describes that data set. Now there may be some folks in here, I know again, we've got some experts in this area that are thinking, no, it's so much more than that. And that is true, but at a very basic level, it's data about data. So we're gonna do an activity today to, for those of you who are new to this subject area, this is gonna introduce you to metadata. And for those who are, who have, who are seasoned and, and really familiar with this, it's just gonna reiterate some of those concepts. So again, bear with me. You're seeing a photo of a plant and potentially thinking, what does this have to do with anything? Here's the activity we're going to do. So in the chat, I would like you to write out different things that you notice about this plant on the left-hand side of the screen. And again, don't hit enter until we instruct you to, but write out things that you notice. This could be words. You could talk about the colors that you see, the shapes that you're seeing with this plant size, any other characteristics, you know, or things that describe what you're seeing in this image. So what you're going to do is take 30 seconds and I will actually time on my screen over here and I'll tell you once we get close, but you're going to take some time right now and write these things that you're seeing in the chat, but don't hit enter quite yet. Okay, so I am going to start now 30 seconds. And I'll let you know once we get close. And be sure not to hit enter quite yet. We'll hit enter all at the same time at 30 seconds. Okay, about four more seconds. It goes very quickly. Okay. Okay, go ahead and hit enter. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Oh, I'm seeing some wonderful things here. Okay, great, 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 great. Okay, so I am seeing some amazing things in the chat. Thank you so much for going through that. So what we're gonna do now is go to the next slide and we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion what you all put into chat is metadata about this plant. You, you just conducted basically a metadata analysis. So in my head, if I was having a conversation with one of you and you were, oh, somebody's annotating. <laughs> so um, if I was having a conversation with one of you and I didn't know what this plant looked like, but let's say that you saw this plant somewhere and you said, Hannah, I need, this plant was beautiful. I need to tell you what this plant looks like. Even if you didn't have a picture for me, but you used some of these descriptions. So I'm going through the chat now. I'm seeing, um, so it's got multiple branches, absolutely. Green, kind of a sphere shape. Um, it's in a green pot. I'm seeing rounded leaves lots of different shades of green. So I'm seeing a lot of these dense canopy. If you were using these descriptors for me, in my head, I could pretty easily start to imagine what this would look like. I could maybe even draw out what this looks like based on your descriptions. And so you can see here metadata, because you use these different descriptions of the plant, it helped me recreate what the actual thing was. Metadata accomplishes this when we think about applying this to data. Again, it's describing some sort of data digital object without, it means that we don't actually have to be looking at it to imagine what it looks like. So you all did an amazing job at that because the things that you put in chat, even if I had not seen that picture, I would be able to pretty much in my mind create what that looked like and I'm confident that it would, it would look a lot like that actual picture. Let's think about this a little further now. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have been to museums, particularly in this case, natural history museums, 
And sometimes the, the little specimens have a tag tied to them. And this, I mean, this could be for any kind of museum. Oftentimes you'll see a little tag or you might see a little placard with information next to the specimen. That's metadata. So particularly here, you can see this tag. It has different things written down about the specimen. That's describing context about how the specimen, um, how, they, how it came to be, how it came to be in possession of this museum, other things that you would need to know about it. So now that we've thought about, you know, what is metadata, what does it look like? I'm going to show you another example. So here I have an image of an Apple II personal computer. And this is actually some metadata that I created. And you can see on the right here, metadata, not all the time, but you'll tend to see it in something that's called an XML file. And I'm going to put that in the chat. XML file. And this is a file that's often saved with a data set. And again, it, may, it describes different things about the data. So in this case, remember when I said earlier that data can be very diverse? So data can actually be physical objects. They can be museum specimens, different things like that. So let's say that this is in a museum. And then I have some metadata that describes that. You can see here, it's got the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, the creators of the computer. I even have the materials in here in the size. So this is sort of doing what that tag is doing for the museum specimen and saying, here's what you need to know to truly understand this piece. So that is sort of metadata in action. Now, one thing I'll say here too, in a lot of this, a lot more details in the handout that you'll get, but what you saw on the previous screen where I had, you know, here's where this lives at, here's what it's made of, I was using a metadata standard. And what that standard can include is actually controlled vocabularies to say, here's the terms that you need to use when, when referring to different things about this data. So there's actually standards for different domain areas. I know a lot of people in this workshop come from so many different areas. And so you see here that I've got a link and you'll get the slides at the end. I've got a link to some different domain areas for metadata. There's also some discipline agnostic standards to where you could use these potentially for any project. Now I see an excellent question in the chat. So metadata does not necessarily convey the meaning significance of the object. Now, I would actually say that it depends, but I've absolutely seen metadata where it has some sort of description as well that talks about the meaning or significance. And so that's absolutely something that you can see, especially when we're having metadata for things like museum specimens, um, objects of some kind, even data sets. There, there can be a little section that's sort of a description or abstract, and that's where you could convey some of that meaning and significance. And when you're looking at different metadata standards, that's where they should be able to talk about that a little more and tell you if there is an existing term within the standard for, for writing things like that. And again, the handout that you'll get at the very end will talk a little bit more about metadata. Okay, excellent. Okay. So that was just a little activity to think about metadata. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to throw that into chat. But what I'm going to go ahead and do is move on to the next one. And this is file naming. So what am I talking about when I say file naming? This is actually naming our digital files in a manner that's organized and descriptive. So this is what I'm thinking about if you have your local file explorer on your computer or a Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever you're using to organize your files. This is talking about what you're naming those actual files. So I have another activity. And what we're going to do here is similar to the metadata activity in that you're going to be given a certain prompt, and in this case, an image. And you're going to type into the chat essentially following the directions that I'll give you, and you're going to wait to put that in chat. Okay, 
So the directions here, you're going to see three images on the screen. And I want you to pretend like those are image files that you have in your research. So that might be, you know, a PNG, JPEG, something like that. Consider these to be image files that are a part of your data, they're a part of your research project, you're saving them where you have all of your other project files on your computer. Now, same thing in the Zoom chat, what I want you to do is type out how you would name this file. And this is where the metadata comes in. Pay attention to what you're seeing in the image that might be really helpful to know or to put in a file name. And don't hit enter until I say. One thing I want to note here is don't worry too much about, okay, you know, I need to make a, a really good file name. I need to do like best practices for a file name. I want you to approach this how you would name files today, right now in your projects, if that makes sense. So don't worry about perfection. Try to hit it to be as close to reality as possible. How would you name this today if you were working on your project? Okay. And again, for everything I will time, I'll say start 30 seconds and then I'll say end and then we'll put everything into the chat. Okay. This is the first image. Now I'm going to describe it before I start the 30 seconds. Now this is a Facebook post. I want you to think about the different metadata that you're seeing within this particular image here. Again, pretend this is an image file on your computer. I am going to start the 30 seconds now. You can type a, and so you're going to type a sample file name. How might you name this image file? You can do more than one if you like. If, you're, if you can think of different ways that you might name this, you can feel free to put that in the chat as well. I'm going to start the 30 seconds now. And I'll tell you when we get close. Got about five more seconds. Okay, so you can now hit enter. Excellent, excellent, look at these, this is great. Oh, this is so good, this is so excellent, okay. So I'm seeing some really cool things here. Now, let me just go through and highlight um, some of the main things I'm seeing. So I'm seeing a lot of underscores being used in between different elements of the file name. I'm seeing Facebook. I'm seeing the date. So you can see here, we've got a date here. I'm seeing Sean Nicholson, who's the creator of this post. I'm seeing Haiku. Excellent, excellent. Let me see what else I'm seeing here. Oh, somebody, ha somebody has Starbucks here, which is a, definitely one of the themes that we're seeing within the within the image i'm seeing facebook post snapshot excellent you all did an amazing job with this so we're going to repeat this again with another image so same thing here's the second image you can see that i've included some metadata here i am going to start the 30 seconds now so write down a potential file name. About 10 more seconds and then we'll hit enter. Okay, go ahead and hit enter. Excellent, excellent. This is great, this is so good. Yep, so I'm seeing so many amazing things. So many people, I would say everybody, are including this metadata in the file name, that is great. I'm seeing some folks that are including the elements of the image that they're seeing. So they're talking about a beach, talking about a shore, that is great. I'm seeing France being in there. Let's see. 
I'm seeing some people include today's date. Excellent, excellent. Great, great. This is wonderful. You all are doing such a good job with this. Okay, we're gonna repeat this one final time. This is an image of an album cover. Okay, so we're gonna do this again. I'm gonna start the 30 seconds right now. Ten more seconds. Okay, go ahead and hit enter. Excellent, excellent. So I'm seeing folks in their file names note that this is an album cover. Great. So we're seeing Elton John. I'm seeing folks talk about the date, the date range. Excellent. And this is really interesting too. So some folks are talking about what the actual image is composed of. So drawing of an artist, great, great, excellent. Okay, so again, some of you may be sitting here and saying, I don't know what this has to do with the data management. Let's move on to the next slide and, and bring this all together. So in a file name, you want to include all the important elements for you and your collaborators. So a lot of folks in here in your registration talked about wanting to learn more about team activity or working within a team. So here, this is really helpful to have some kind of file naming scheme that works for you and your team and helps you quickly identify files. So if you look through the chat here, you can see where folks are including different elements. So elements for particularly this last one would be things like the artist's name, Elton John, the date, what it is, so it's an album cover, greatest hits, which describes sort of the context of the photo. Those are all different elements. Now, some of your file names are very different than other people in the workshop. Does that mean either of those file names are wrong? Not necessarily. So what that just means is that folks have different things that are important to them in a data set, and that's okay. So what you wanna do, especially when working on a team, is come up with a file naming scheme that, is, that essentially says, when we're working on this team, and we have files that we produce within a particular data analysis or something like that, we're gonna name them using the following file naming convention and have that written down somewhere with your data. That could be just a, a Word document or a Google Doc or some kind of text file that you keep with your data sets, but it's something that the team can refer to and know how to name their files consistently. So I have some tips here for file naming, which luckily so many of you already are following these tips. Ideally, you should have no spaces in the file name. It's always a good idea to use underscores instead when you're separating the different elements. I'm seeing so many people do this already in the chat, which is wonderful. So I, I really recommend using underscores when possible. So you can see an example here, if I have a PDF file and it's a map that I've created, I have some different elements here. I have my surname, I have the date, the map number, the version number. These are the different elements and I'm separating them with underscores. You can see here, this is a file name that has some important elements, but it's got spaces in it. I would recommend ideally not doing that. So ideally using underscores. And that matters more, it tends to matter more in a computational sense. Sometimes when you're bringing in files into some sort of analysis software or computer programming, it, it can make it very difficult or problematic if there's spaces in a file name. So next, I see some of you following this as well already, which is fantastic. Dates 
should ideally be written, it's called an ISO 8601 format. And this is an international standard for writing dates. And so we can see here, it's the year written fully out, the month written fully out, and the day written fully out. So I have an example here, 2020, June 27. And putting it this way, putting the date this way in a file name just means with an international team, that date's gonna be recognized more easily. Now I have an example of why this is so important to use this date. I have a, I live in the USA and I have a collaborator in the United Kingdom. And we both write dates differently, just sort of based on, I guess what we're used to, you know, growing up in two very different areas. And that can be very problematic because I may write a date a certain way and he may write a date a different way. And that means that we've scheduled meetings completely different at completely different times because we're both looking at the dates differently. Maybe we get deadlines wrong, so on and so forth. So in a team based environment like you all are working in, highly recommend using this standard within a file name to write out the dates. Okay. Now this varies, but I would say if at all possible, try and limit the character size to your file name. I like to suggest less than 35 characters. And so by character, I mean a specific, a specific character from your, um, from your keyboard. That's really for human readability, but actually some cases your computer or a certain software or something like that is not gonna let you have a very long file name. But if we just think about this, let's say that our software didn't care, you know, we could have these long file names it's not, there's not a lot of human readability for a very long file name like that. And if I'm looking through the chat here, I'm, I'm not seeing anything that looks like it's necessarily over 35 characters. I'm seeing some that are getting close, but most folks kept it pretty concise while also capturing metadata. And this is for all three pictures. Now, again, I'm going to go back though and talk about this and say that any file naming scheme is better than nothing. So if you look through the chat and we have all of these three different pictures. Ich um, sag es gerade neu, wie spricht hier? Ich bin derjenige, der wegen der der beiden äh Schüler aus Doha angerufen hat. Äh hat someone unmuted there. Uh let's see. Yeah, so if you can see here that I'm, you know, I'm talking about a lot of different things. So include the elements that's important to you, include the date if possible, but make it less than these characters. You might be sitting there and saying, okay, how do I do this? Like, how do I include all of these things, but keep it at a manageable size? What I want you to remember is, is this is kind of coming up with a good file naming scheme for your team is almost like a dance, right? Because you're thinking about what are the different elements that make sense for us? And how do we keep it in a way that just we can read and it makes sense? Um, so what I would say is within your team, think about what elements make the most sense to you in a file name and then write it down and give it a try. You know, a month later, if you're having trouble finding files, that means that maybe your file naming scheme is not working great. So I'm seeing the chat here. Absolutely. Okay. So. Um, Jonas, the, you use the ISO 8601 format for dates, which is excellent, but tend to drop the hyphen in the file names, yes. So the question here, so this is sort of a team-based question, which is relevant for all of you. I've got colleagues who tend to name files beginning with the date, and I find it troublesome when I browse my folders. Yes, is there any standard advice around this? So what I would say, Jonas, and to the rest of the group too, is that the advice around this is that there's there's no standard advice but essentially what you want to do is make sure what works best for the team to browse files so it sounds like in this particular case you know you have colleagues that are naming files beginning with the date but that's not necessarily working for you and helping you quickly find files and the goal is to have everybody on the team all the collaborators be able to fairly quickly locate these files so what I would say here is that, again, there's no standard advice around this. It's more of what works best for the team, and particularly what you have at the beginning of your file name 
is what the team should agree on is almost the most important thing for locating data. So this might be a case where I would talk to your team and say, does it really, do we really need to have the date first? Is that the most important thing for our file names? And then think about another file naming scheme that you might use. So it is, you know, it is a conversation that you have, but whatever you have first in that file name, I would say generally needs to be the most important thing for finding the data. So hopefully that helps. Great. Are there any other questions at this point? Okay. You can always feel free to throw those in chat. Okay. I am going to preface this with this is our, this is going to be the longest activity. And it's also, this is where I would say just bear with us because you're going to be, we're going to be doing a few different things with you throughout this. But we've actually, we're ahead of schedule at this point. We've allotted some extra time for this. So at any point, if you feel rushed during this particular activity, just let us know in the chat. Okay. Documentation and workflows is another skills training that we are going to work on today. When I say documentation and workflow, I am talking about writing down how we do things in a project and why. The reason that I include this in this training is because I, I am a researcher as well, and I do computer programming, so I, I use Python. And for anybody in here, and if you, if you experience this, please feel free to put this in the chat if you're comfortable too, just so I don't feel so alone. But when I'm writing a, a script using Python, and I'm, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to build it this way, and here's why I'm going to do this. In my head, I always say, yeah, I'll remember why I made this decision. I'll remember why I decided to create you know, a loop here to bring in the data here. I'll remember why I did this. And then three months later, when I'm going to write the paper that talks about, you know, using this script and I'm writing the method section, I never remember why I did certain things. And I think that's so common when we think about, we're all researchers in some form in this workshop. We have so many things going on at the same time. So we're doing research. We, may, we might also be teaching. We might also have families. You know, we, we have all of these other things that we're doing. So I think it's completely natural that we're not, yes, I, it's leave notes for your future self. I would say, speaking for myself, not speaking for anybody else, but I give my future self so much more credit than I should because I always think I'm going to remember these things and I never remember <laughs> the little details of why I decided to do something in a project and it makes writing that method section so much harder later on. So this activity is actually going to tell us, it's actually going to help you think more about writing good documentation and then we'll come back at the very end and apply this a little bit more specifically to your projects. Okay, good to go. So this is the activity. Again, bear with me because there's a few instructions that we're gonna be getting out here. So the directions. What's gonna happen is that you are going to be put into a breakout room. So you're gonna see a pop-up on your screen that says join breakout room. You're gonna join that. And once you're in there, you're going to be given a link to a Google Drive, a document in a Google Drive. So everybody in the breakout room should open that link. It's going to be a picture of something. At that point, if you want to take a screenshot, you can, or if you just want to keep that picture open, but you're going to want that picture up for the entire activity. Okay. As a team, using the whiteboard function, you're going to take about, it's going to be about 10 minutes. I'm going, to be, I'm going to give you a good chunk of time to do this, about 10 minutes. You're going to write out five things. And so this could be directions. It could be a sentence that somebody would need to know to draw the picture, which it's going to be a creature of some kind. What would they need to know to draw that without explicitly saying the name of the creature? So let me reiterate what that looks like. So when I run this workshop in person, 
what I would do is give the different folks in the workshop a picture. And in my case, I use Pokemon, the video game in the, it's a very, very broad popular culture thing, but um, I would give them a picture of a Pokemon and say, I want you to write out directions for how to draw this Pokemon without naming it. So it might be, okay, well, this one has four legs. So I'm going to write that out. Um, it's pink with blue stripes. I'm going to write that out. You can see I'm writing down directions, but I'm not naming it at any point because we could just say, oh, it's this Pokemon, draw this Pokemon, but that's not super helpful. So we're describing that. You're going to recreate that in here. So within your breakout rooms as a team, again, using the whiteboard function to type out those directions. If you want to write more than five things, you know, if you have time, go ahead, but don't worry about writing more than that. Focus on what are, what are the five most important things you would need to know about what this animal, about what this creature looks like to draw it without saying the name of it. Okay. So again, you're going to write those directions on the whiteboard. Here's the next stage of the directions, just so you know what to expect. So what we're going to do then is one person in the breakout room is going to stay there. And that's the person you can sort of think of yourself as you're the, you're the reporter, you're the moderator of that room. Choose one person to stay there. They're going to stay there with your whiteboard. And what we're going to do in the back end is switch everybody else around into new rooms. And so then you're going to see their whiteboard with the directions that they wrote for how to draw that particular creature. And this is where if you have a piece of paper, if you have a pen, a pencil, uh, ideally something dark ahead of, um, in front of you, individually you're going to try and draw this creature based on the directions you see on the whiteboard. And we have no judgment here for artistic skills, right? You're just going to, you're going to try and recreate this, what this drawing looks like. And then in your breakout room, what you'll do is you'll literally just after, you know, we'll give you a chunk of time to do this. It'll be about three minutes. So it's quick. You're going to just hold your pictures up to your camera. You may have to hold them up very close to your camera to show what you drew. And you can see the different manifestations of how people looked at those instructions in your breakout room. And once you do that, we're going to all come back together and go from there. So I know that was a lot of instructions. Now, what we'll be doing during this, the first steps, again, you're just going to be put into, the, into these Zoom rooms. You're going to get a Google Drive link. You're going to take 10 minutes to write out these five things. Now, we'll pop in and out of Zoom rooms just to make sure that everybody's doing okay and everybody's sort of on track. But it, expect to be in there for about 10 minutes doing this, and then we'll send a little note into, into your Zoom room that talks about next steps. Okay, does that sound good to everybody? Okay, excellent. So this is where you may need to bear with us a little bit. We're going to be doing this on the back end. But you should see a notice to join a breakout room at some point in the very near future. So I'm going to open the breakout rooms. Um, Hannah, just heads up to you. You are also in a breakout room, so you will be beamed into a room um, automatically. Excellent. Okay, I'm opening all rooms now. And that Hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry to, to uh, interrupt. I'm here and I see that everything is going and you're already doing your uh, workflow. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and Judith um, yeah. works with birds, so she'd be able to know. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> is that a question? A bird question? <laughs> <laughs> Try to make sure we're accurately capturing a macaw. Oops. If I didn't see the picture, of course I'm biased because I've seen the pictures, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe I would think a macaw or a, a toucan, maybe large with curved beak. Yeah. Short beak would be sure that would be a good no, curved yeah. but short white beak. Yes. Fantastic. So um, 
Erica, I see you're the one sharing the whiteboard, so you will stay put in this room. <clears throat> and, and then we'll see if, if the other team can draw this based on your instructions. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'll ask her about that. Yeah. Yeah, so when you're doing stuff like this, how this applies, oh, black bordered flippers. Yeah, I was wondering if somebody was gonna mention that. Yeah, that's a good point is that we've got these stripes, we've got the orange color, but also on their on their little, little flippers, we're seeing that black border there. Yeah. Hi, Hannah, I, I, I jumped in your room, came Hi. to visit. <laughs> How's it going? Um, everyone has their link and their whiteboard, so, so that's really good. Good. Uh, um, if you want to start jumping around and visiting, um, feel free. Um, Santosh, I see that you are sharing your uh, screen. So you will be the person who stays in this room um, to then, uh, you know, let the other teams uh, read this and then make their drawing. Does that Thank sound you. good? Sure, no problem. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And that way, you know, if anybody has questions too, and they're saying, well, what do you mean by medium size? You, you know, you can always give context to that. Uh, so at this point, I've got, um, Judith, I've got my timer here. We've got about just a little over three minutes left. So I'll start jumping into the other rooms and then Excellent. I will, I'll send you a little Slack message when we hit the, the time. <laughs> sounds good. Um, yes, that sounds really good. Excellent. Well, everybody in this breakout room, it was really great chatting with you. I'm going to go hop around and just see what other folks are doing. Um, yeah, Thank so you. I, will, I will see you all soon. Okay, so uh, do you have a brand new crew here, Sylvie? Yeah, it looks that way, yeah. All right, so you guys can get to drawing. drawing. Okay, yes. thank you, Judith. Thank you, I will visit another room now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, okay, Ruth oh, says good. yes. Yeah, have you seen these instructions before? No. Okay, great, so you can get drawing. Your task is to draw this creature Oh. based on these instructions right now. No, you don't have to use the whiteboard for drawing. You can use a piece of paper. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. So follow the instructions. I'm going to leave you guys alone, and I will visit another breakout room. Thank you. I think this... Yeah, I, I was in another group. Okay, perfect. You were in another group, so that's good. Yeah, you can, right. you, just, you, you can get, get drawing on based on the, and these drawing. instructions. <laughs> okay, no. visit more rooms now. Done. Okay, now you should have a small <laughs> room. <laughs> we do, we get, do. All right, get drawing on a piece of paper. and We okay. will, we will. We have one more introduction. Okay, uh, great. Jans, and then we're going to start art time. Okay, so now we have um, Jan, Lydia, um, Rekha, Peter, Tomoko, Sol, and Vidya. You guys are new here with Vanessa. We are new. Awesome. Vidya is new. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So your task is to draw the creature on a piece of paper based on these instructions. <laughs> uh, it might be a challenge, so get, get drawing. Um, Thank you, Judith. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Right, now I think, I don't recognize the name, but I didn't flip around in, the, in mm -hmm. this bar that much. So It's, it's all good. So, um, Victoria, Yasmin, Sakella, um, are you guys new in this room? Have you seen these instructions before? Oh, you, you are all on mute, so we don't know. Okay, I see Hannah, you're new to this room, fantastic. So your task is to look at this whiteboard and try to draw the creature on a piece of paper based on what you see. 
Okay, great. I'm, I'm getting confirmations that you guys are new and you have already drawn. So perfect. You, you know what you're doing. Um, so Jonas knows what these instructions are described. So if you hold up the picture to the camera and share it, he would be able to check your work and see, um, not your work, really, his group's work <laughs> on whether they get left good instructions to create it. Okay, see some drawings. <laughs> Beautiful. Hold it close to the camera. Perfect. I, I think, yeah, we, we have identified at least the, the, the taxon pretty closely. Sakella and Victoria, you guys can and also give it a try and share it. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm traveling, oh, so okay. I cannot do much. Oh. Okay, good, good. But you can see, I hope you can see the pictures others are sharing. Yes, I'll camera. just see pictures of the others. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah. All right, so th this exercise is going pretty well. I'm going to just follow up in all the other rooms and um, make sure that um, everyone is on board with workflow. All right. Hi, everyone. I see some drawings happening. Is, is everyone working quietly? It sounds like. Feel free to draw on paper and just hold it up to the camera and share. Yeah, I already have. <gasps> This one. <laughs> that's a different one. Different. Yeah, that's one. a different one. That's that's the one I had had, had to read. Yeah. Did anyone else share? I'm just visiting the rooms now. Yeah, we did already. Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah, we did. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, great, great. All right, everyone should be back. Great. Sounds good. Okay. So thank you so much, everybody, for you know your patience in that activity. I saw some amazing drawings in that particular activity. So what I figured we would do at this point, a lot of folks were saying, you know, show us what the actual things were. <laughs> and so I'm going to very quickly do that. I'm, I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm going to share my screen. OK, so this was one of the, this was one of the images. So the folks who had the particular instructions that correspond to what, so we, did we do the image like per breakout room number, Judy? Okay, yes. yeah, so this is image one. So this would be if you were in breakout one, okay. This is image two. So we have a clownfish. Image three. Image four, <laughs> image five, and image six. So those are all of the actual images we had. And I'm gonna make sure I have my chat up here. So at any point, if you wanna share what your drawing looked like, feel free to just put that in the chat, say I'm sharing my drawing, and then that way we know which name to look for in the videos. Yeah. Maybe we can do, uh, sorry to interrupt and, and come up with a new idea, but maybe we could do like a gallery view of everyone holding up their pictures. Yeah. Uh, if we would need to stop sharing screen okay. and everyone hit gallery view. Sure. Yeah. Let me stop sharing here and I've got gallery view up. I'm going to hold up mine. You can, you can feel free to laugh. Mine, mine is, is very... Um, <laughs> Oh, look at all these. Oh my gosh. Look at all these beautiful pictures. <laughs> this is amazing. This uh, is so cool. So I um, love this because I didn't get to draw. I, I was just visiting and I only saw very few, but it's amazing. I, yeah. Oh my gosh. Great. Look at this. This is so great. This is so great, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for oh sharing. And Thank you us. so much, everybody. <laughs> Ah, oh, wonderful. I really wonderful, appreciate wonderful. this. <laughs> this is great. This is excellent. So what I'm going to do is we're going to just wrap all of this up together. I'm going to share my screen again. And we'll just wrap 
this particular part up before the break. I'm gonna view. Okay, so we went through this, this little activity and what you did is you wrote documentation. And as you were going through this, you know, a lot of your, I looked at your directions in the different breakout rooms, you listed metadata, you listed context for where this creature lives, what they're doing, you know, what is it about their species? So you wrote excellent documentation for this. So now let's bring this all back to research. So I have some recommended practices that are especially for a team-based environment, like really all of you are working in. When you're writing documentation, you're seeing here, you, I really recommend having some kind of digital notebook. So again, we all drew this on our own, on our own individual notebook. Some people use the whiteboard, but if I had a workflow and I wanted to share that with somebody, it's gonna be a lot easier, especially with a team and maybe we're in different countries, different time zones, different disciplines. If we can share those different things in a digital environment, that's great. So with something like this, I recommend using a digital notebook. And in the handout that you'll get at the very end of the workshop, I actually recommend some tools for, for doing that. So one of them that I wanna really briefly mention right now is a free tool called protocols.io. And this is actually a workflow tool. And what I can do at the very end, if we have time, is do a few just little tool reviews. And we may find that we have some time prior to the workshop ending. So, but this is on the, the handout. But honestly, even if you don't want to use a particular software program, even having a shared Google Doc or a shared, you know, some kind of shared document where you can write down your workflows for here's how we collect data, here's how we analyze data, here's how we run this particular piece of code so on and so forth. That is great. As long as the team has access to it, again, just like with file naming, whatever works for the team is the right strategy, okay? So again, you wrote documentation and much like you did this, you were doing this so another group could recreate it. So you weren't writing this documentation so you could recreate it. But when we're talking about documentation for our own research, we're also, we're doing it so we can recreate it. And so we can refer to it when we're writing our final reports and our manuscripts, our presentations, but also so other people can understand it. Maybe even people outside of our subject area, could they understand what we're doing based on our documentation? So detail is good. Detail is absolutely good in this situation. So really quickly before break, I have a few things. So we've gone through all of the skills training and now the question is, okay, this is great, but how do I incorporate this into a project? What I have here are some really just quick tips and tricks for making sure that this is a part of your culture within your research project. The first is making it a part of your workflow. You should, you should truly see data management as being something is just as important as the data collection, the analysis, the visualization, the writing the manuscript. You should see data management as a, a true important part of that workflow. Having a data manager for your project is excellent, but understand it's also everybody's responsibility to support the culture of data management. So stick to the file naming schemes, you know, write documentation, different things like that. It's really everybody's responsibility, even the one person may be actually running that. What I recommend is in your team, set aside 15 minutes a week or whatever, how many, however much time you need set aside 15 minutes a week to do a quality check on your data. So are we sticking with the file naming schemes? Are we staying up to date on our workflows? So on and so forth. The reason for this, if you do a little bit every week, it means that when you get to the end of the project, you don't realize that there was a data management disaster. You know, somebody stopped using file naming scheme two months ago or somebody's workflow documentation is lost. That way you don't realize it at the very end. I would try and do a little bit every week if possible. And finally, when you have your team meetings, because I know a lot of folks in here, you're, you're in different places, you're meeting over Zoom or over Skype or over the phone, however you do, however you do that, 
always devote a part of your team meeting to data management where you can talk about data management and talk about how you're doing it. Are, are things changing based on how your data are changing based on your analysis? Make it a regular part of your agenda. Okay, so now we have a break. We're gonna start the program back in 10 minutes sharp. So we'll say at uh, about, about 9.50, we'll start back. So in the meantime, if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to throw those in chat. So at the hour 50, yeah. you come back and please everyone, if you can ask you to turn off your camera while you're on the break, and then when you return, turn it back on so we know that everyone is back in the room. Great. Thank you all, see you in 10 minutes. Do is I'm, I'm going to leave the actual uh, slides here and give you a little tour of a few tools here. But what we have resources available to you are actually a scorecard for your DDOMPs to test the effectiveness of your DDOMP in describing adequately your data management, uh, a policy comparison tool, a toolkit, and some data management training videos. So what I'm going to do at this point, this link is very important. So this link, not only when you have the slides, will you have this, but also on the handout that you'll get at the end of the workshop, it'll have all the relevant links you need. So I would say right now, just constant, don't worry too much about writing down URLs, just concentrate on um, the, let's see, concentrate on the actual tour. So this is following the link to the main um, website for e-infrastructures and data management. And you can see here, this is extremely important. Uh, it's, yeah, just right on the left side here, towards the bottom of the page, you can see some general principles and policies for data when you're doing your research. And let's see, I am going to, I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit here so folks can, there we go, perfect, oopsie. Uh, let's see, where did the, oh, it looks like it crunched the screen a little bit. Let me, that's okay, I can still, okay, so I'm going to zoom in just so you can see the font a little bit more. But just when you go right to this link, what you're seeing here are some general, you know, policies and principles. Why do we care about open data? Why does it matter? And then how is the Belmont Forum supporting that? And from here, what you can see too is, you know, different things about what your data should look like in an idea, in a perfect world. You know, this is what you want to strive for your data to look like in your project and your data management. Now, what I'm going to do is just really briefly scroll back just to this size, just so you can see here. Now, if I click, the first thing we'll look at is the toolkit. If you click toolkit, it's going to take you to another actual at this stage, another website. Um, and what this toolkit offers is so many resources for you as you're working on your project, as you're working on refining your DDOMP and your general data management practices. So if you see here, I'm gonna zoom just to the, just so you can see when you scroll in what that's gonna look like. You're gonna see three main sections. You're gonna see recommended practices for data management links to different trainings, and a researcher guide for creating a DDOMP. Now, for the purposes of this particular tutorial, I'm going to go to researcher guide, and I'm going to zoom in a little more, just so you can see here. Now, what this guide offers you is actually step-by-step -step instructions for making a DDOMP at multiple stages of your project. So if I scroll down here, you can actually find support for the three different stages that you will find yourself in when you're writing these DDOMPs. So we have our pre-proposal, full proposal, and awarded projects. Now for the sake of this, you're gonna click find guidelines. We're gonna go to the full proposal stage. And what you can see here is we have some videos that are linked and I'm also gonna show you some of those videos or show you where they are in a moment. But then you can see the questions here that you would need to include in that DDOMP in your final report, so on and so forth. And we actually have direct links to resources to help you answer those questions. So if you're not too sure how to answer one of these, we have direct links to help you here. 
So you can see here that it's talking about, okay, what do my data need to look like? They need to be understandable in a way that allows researchers, including those that are not in your discipline, to understand them. And then a description on how to do that. Right, so you should never you should never feel alone when you're going through this process of expanding your DDOMP and updating it, writing it, doing your final report on it. Because these resources re these resources are here. We are here to help with that process. And so that is the DDOMP support. And I do just want to really quickly highlight there's some other resources as well. If I go to the data management training section. There are some training opportunities by geographic region. Now I will note that some of these regions as of right now still need to be expanded. So still some of the resources still need to be um, expanded a little bit. So if you're looking at your region and you're saying there's not much here, just know that that is a work in progress. By resource type, so you can see here we have different uh, resources. This would be an online course that you can take. And you can see direct links to those particular courses, so on and so forth. So see the toolkit is something that could be a regular part of your research. If you have a question, let's check the toolkit and see if there's an answer there. You can see how this is, this is a really good resource for you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is let's go back to this. So now I'm gonna talk about some of these other tools here. And as Judith mentioned in the chat, absolutely, if you ever say, if you ever see something and you say, you know, this isn't actually in the, the toolkit itself, um, I think this should be in here, you can always let us know. Again, it's, it's always, it's a living, a living toolkit. So the next thing I'm going to show you here is the policy comparison tool. And again, if you go just to that main landing page, it's always going to be on the left here, the policy comparison tool. I am going to zoom in a little bit here and just show you a few. Okay, so what this does is you can actually look at the different data policies from different organizations. And so as you can see here, there's a few different things that it's talking about. You know, what are their differences in data management planning, power data to be publicly shared, um, different things like that. So let's do an example. I'll do the Academy of Finland. I'm going to scroll here. Let's do, let's see, do this here. And let's do China. Okay. So what I can, what you can see happening here now is that I can scroll down and see where there's some differences, right? And you can see some spots, some spots are blank now. Again, this is a living document. We're always updating these resources, but you can see some differences in when data are to be publicly shared. So I'm seeing some guidelines here that vary from this other organization. I'm seeing some guidelines here that may vary from these other organizations, right? So this tool, especially if you're working on these interdisciplinary teams, you're maybe in different countries and you need to think about these different policies when you're writing your DDOMP, this is a great tool. And again, if there's something missing that you say, mm, I know that this organization has information on that, always feel free to let us know and we can update that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is go back to the main landing page. And I'm just going to briefly talk about this data management plan scorecard. This is such a good resource for you. So if I go to this scorecard and you click on that, it's actually going to take you to another website and it's going to take you to a repository called Zenodo. And this is where you can see how to use this scorecard and some additional documentation. So what this does is it allows you to actually score your DDOMP to say, did I do this correctly? Did I write enough to give enough detail on how I'm managing the data, how I'm sharing the data, who has access to it? What are we doing with it after the project is done? All of these different questions. The scorecard is gonna allow you as a team to look at your DDOMP and actually say, okay, you know, am I doing this, am I doing this correctly? What it's also going to allow you to do and I'm going to pull this over here. Can everybody see the scorecard? Yep, seeing some nods. Okay, so you can see here where you can go step by step 
in different sections of your DDOMP and actually say, okay, so here, the plan lists the types of data and other digital objects of long-term value, a complete response, which would give you a score of two. You can see that it's this is a lot of detail. I'm seeing here transcripts, encoding will be provided in text files, audio recording will be in MP3 format. Not only are they talking about the different types of data, but they're talking about the format that those data will be saved in. So that's really, really, that's really, really important. Over here, even though they're using more text, it's not necessarily more detail because it's very, very broad. We're not seeing exactly what kinds of data it'll be. We're not seeing, you know, what format are they going to be saved in? And so here, if I had, that's where you can have a really good idea of, you know, am I doing enough? And you can score yourself. And essentially it's, it's all the directions here are laid out for how you, what that score looks like. If you have a complete score, it's going to be a maximum of two and it's going to be more than one or equal to one, right? Incomplete if you're less than one. And that's when you know that maybe you need to go back and expand the DDOMP a little bit. So one thing I do want to note is that actually these scorecards are actively used to score your DDOMPs um, by the Belmont Forum who are looking at your DDOMPs in, in your final reporting and at these different stages. So we'll have more information about the end of the workshop, how we'd like to get a little bit more involved in that using your own DDOMPs. And again, that is available on Zenodo. So the final thing that I'm going to share is the data management training videos. And this link will be in the handout. So you will, you'll have a link to go directly to this. This is on YouTube. And you can see here, there's a bunch of different videos. So again, why is data management important? And then specifically on the toolkit, so I gave you a very, very, very quick tour of the toolkit just because, you know, we're on a time constraint in a workshop, but these videos will actually give you more page by page information on how to use that toolkit. So I highly recommend checking those out. There's also, again, I gave you a very quick rundown of the scorecard. There's a module for using the scorecard as well. And it is about half an hour. It's, it's very extensive and it's going to give you all the information you need. So I highly recommend checking out these videos. And again, you will have the link to it. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, we're going to shift into our next section here, which is writing an effective DDOMP. Now I know folks in here have written DDOMPs and this is for some folks this is going to be sort of a refresher and for other folks this is giving you more information to make your DDOMP as impactful and effective as possible. And I do have questions that have been sent in chat and so what I'm going to do is you will get your answers. I'll make sure to, to collect those and if we don't have time to answer in the workshop I will send you an email. Okay, so writing an effective DDOMP. And what is a DDOMP? So that stands for Data and Digital, uh, Digital Outputs Management Plan. Now, if you've applied for funding from other agencies, you might recognize the term DMP, which is a data management plan. And this is similar, but also has some extra context to it and extra things that we'll talk about. So there's what this DDOMP does, it ensures that your data will be discoverable so people can find it because you did all this work. You want people to find it accessible as open data so people can use it after they find it and understandable so they can use it effectively. You know, you can see how we're building on this. You know, we can make it discoverable, but if it's not usable, that's not, that's, it, it almost defeats the purpose. So we're building on this and then manageable. So you have your data out there. It's described well. It's reproducible because it has been described well, and it's safe. So if somebody five years from now wants to use it, great. If somebody for an even longer time period wants to see your data, wants to try and use that, excellent. And that's what the DDOMP is aimed at, is making you as researchers think about these different things and what can you do with your data now to ensure that it'll meet these different criteria. And again, this is a, a direct repeat from earlier. Why do we do data management? Well, why do we write a DDOMP? 
again, this is a return on investment for a funding agency who's invested uh, financial, they've invested time, invested all these things in a project and in a researcher team. They want to see that return on investment and make sure that the data are protected and that it gets that public benefit and benefit to science as a whole. Right, so we have many reasons that we write a DBOMP. Sometimes when we're applying for funding and we say, okay, here's another thing we have to do, you know, it can feel like a burden, but I really would encourage you in this situation to, to not see a DDOMP as a burden. This is helping you as a researcher. It's making sure that you are going to have maximum impact of your work because everybody in here is doing amazing work. And the DDOMP is going to help you highlight that. So I would love for you to see this as something that you get excited about, right? And one of the most important things is to think about this as a living document. And what this really should say is a minimum of three stages because as a living document, it's gonna change over time. That, the idea is not that we write the DDOMP in the beginning and then it just, we never look at it again, or we write it at the very end and then that's it. It should be a living document. And what I mean by that, again, it's not a static document, but it's something that changes based on how your project progresses. And you are expected to keep that up to date. And this is where when I mentioned the, you know, take 15 minutes every week and, you're, and do a data quality check, wrap this in, you know, wrap this into the part of your meeting where you're talking about data management and say, okay, is our DDOMP up to date? Has anything changed in the software we're using? the team, you know, maybe somebody's left the team, maybe someone has joined the team. Is there anything that we need to change? If you do it as you go, it's going to be so much easier on you in the long run. You're doing it for your future self. So many of you know this already. There are three different stages where your deed, it's sort of check marks for your DDOMP. So you have that pre-proposal, the exploration, intensive interest, the full proposal, and then the awarded projects. And many of you will be working on your final report, which has a DDOMP portion to it. So there's three check marks, but really think about this as a living document that you update throughout your project. And one thing to always think about is that research changes. I can think about when I started my PhD and I had my dissertation topic, I had it in my first year, here's what I'm gonna do. And in my fourth year, things were similar things were absolutely similar and certainly when you're getting funding for a project you want it to be you know you want to do you want to do what you said you're going to do right but some things can change within that and that's something that you want to reflect in your ddomp you know maybe you lose access to a certain software or you find a better software again maybe somebody joins the team maybe somebody has to leave the team Things change like that, and that's okay. You just want to you want that to be reflected in your DDOMP, so it is a living document. Okay, so we have a. Uh, this is our final activity of the workshop, and it's actually mind mapping your DDOMP. Now, when I say mind mapping, what do I mean by that? I'm going to actually do a demo, so you can see exactly what I mean. But with mind mapping, that's actually a way that I can draw out my project. And so we, when we say mind map, the idea is that, okay, we're thinking in our mind, what are all the different pieces of the project? What's the data? Where are we storing the data? Who has access to it? Uh, what literature am I gonna be referring to? All those different things in this giant web of a research project. So mind mapping it is a way to just understand all of those moving parts that are happening. Now mind mapping, a project, as you'll explain it in a DDOMP, is a really great way to make sure that you're thinking about all of these different aspects of what needs to go into your DDOMP from the project. So what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll leave the slide deck, but you'll still be able to see my screen, and I'm gonna show a tool called draw.io, and I'm actually gonna mind map a project of my own. And what I'll do is I'm gonna focus on two questions from the DDOMP prompts from the, the final report. And this is what kind of data sets or other digital outputs of long-term value do you expect the project will produce or reuse, and then how you intend to manage the data and everything else that comes out of the project. 
So again, I'm mind mapping, but I'm rooting this within the questions of the DDOMP, right? Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is go to, this is draw.io. You, when you do this in your breakout rooms, you're just gonna do this on a piece of paper. You could conceive, you know, you could use an online tool if you want, but you'll just do this on a piece of paper. So this, so what I'm building here, I'm going to put the actual project, uh, let's see, I'm going to put the actual project theme in the middle. So what I'm looking at is the health of, and I, and I will zoom in too so you can see this better, because this is going to be tiny, tiny, tiny. Okay. Okay. So health of lobster fisheries in coastal Maine in the USA. So that's my project, right? That is the, you know, in a sentence, here's what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do now, remember that first question, so what kind of data that has long-term value or other digital outputs with long-term value do I think are going to come from this? Okay, well, that's going to be an offshoot of that. So I'm going to, and one of the things I'm going to produce are CSV files with different biological characteristics of the lobster. That's a data set coming from that. Now, remember, it says data and digital outputs. And again, data are not just the actual data sets that we're talking about. So what else is going to come from this? Well, I'm going to have a code book that actually says what kind of variables I have in my CSV file. What are the column names? What are, what are the things you would need to know to go through my data and understand it? So code book for CSV files. And I'm going to connect that because that's another piece of data that comes out of it. Okay, so I have that. Here's another thing that's going to come from this is that let's say I'm doing some statistical analyses and I'm using R, which is an open source tool, and I have some code that took hours to write and I don't want my team members to have to recreate this code. I want them to be able to use my code and understand it. Well, I'm going to have code that comes from this. And when folks are in the future, if they want to use my data and try and recreate this project, I want them to have access to the code. You know, that's a digital output from this project. So we'll go ahead and put a, okay, so those, if I think about that, that's three types of data and digital outputs. So you can see how I'm mind mapping this out. Okay, I'm starting to think about these things. Now, the second question was, how do you intend to manage these? for long-term, you know, long-term preservation and access. Well, a few things that I'm thinking, I'm gonna make these a different shape. So with the CSV files, I'm saving them in CSV format, which is great because that's an open format. But one other thing I'm gonna do is have three copies. So there's, there's this adage that three or lots of copies keep stuff safe. And there's a few other, uh, recommendations around this, which I'll have in the handout for you. But just for now, I'm going to make three copies of that to protect its long-term value. And that way I'm making sure that if I lose a primary copy or if something gets corrupted, I'm going to have some backups. Now, let's think about up here with my code. I'm going to make this a little smaller. I, in this particular situation, am going to score, or the store my code in GitHub. Now GitHub is a, it's a version control tool. There is a user or an interface point and click interface version of it. And that is something where if you want to learn more how to use that, you can absolutely feel free to contact me and I can send resources. GitHub is a great place to store code. So I'm going to store that in GitHub, right? So you can kind of see how I'm mapping this out. And then when I go to write my DDOMP, I can look at this and say, okay, yeah, when it asks these different questions, I know how to answer this based on how I'm going through this project and mapping this out. Does that make sense to everybody how that process is? And 
it will be messy because sometimes our research doesn't fit neatly into little boxes like this. It, it's complicated. So it will be messy, but this is a really good activity for starting to think about okay, when I'm writing this final report for this DDOMP and I've been working on this research for so long, making sense of it all, right? And making sure that you can write the DDOMP effectively. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is save this and that way we can give you access in case you'd like to see an, an example later on of that mind map. So what we're going to do now, okay, so let me go. So I did the demo and I, again, I rooted it to these two questions, which are actual questions from the DDOMP. And these questions are in the toolkit as well. And remember, I showed you the section for the DDOMP researcher guide. All the questions you need are in there as well. So what's going to happen now is you're going to get a chance to do this. Now, you will be put into breakout rooms. And we're gonna take we're gonna take about 10 minutes to do this after you get in your breakout room because again this can be very detailed right to actually mind map your project you're gonna draw a mind map and you're you're welcome to use draw.io you can also just use a piece of paper right and you're gonna start mapping this out okay what is what is the topic of my research what are the different you know outputs of data how am I gonna store them and when you're making your mind map, you can see I have these three questions here, which what I can do is after you're in your breakout rooms, I can put them in the chat so you have them, or you can feel free to take a screenshot of this. You're gonna mind map based on these questions that actually come from that final report. Okay, so like I did, what kind of data sets or digital outputs, again, can include code books, can include documentation, workflows, different things like that. Do you expect it'll produce or it could be reusable? How do you intend to ensure that they conform to those open data principles that I talked about? How are you gonna make sure it's accessible? How are you gonna make sure that people can understand it, that people can access it for a long time after the project is done? And then are there other supporting documentation that you'll make publicly available? So remember, we talked about metadata maybe one of these outputs is that you have an XML file that you keep with your data so folks can can have that as a reference right so you are going to go through take about 10 minutes in your group and on your own individually mind map your project now if you have anything that's you know sensitive data or, or something don't you know don't put anything in the mind map that you wouldn't want to share with a broader group because there will be a discussion aspect after that does that make sense to everybody right now? Okay, excellent, I'm seeing lots of head nods. Okay, so what will happen now is you'll get put into breakout rooms. I will make sure that these questions get put into chat and we will come together in 10 minutes. I'm opening the breakout rooms. Team members may be creating um, their own and needing to look at it as sort of an ecosystem of information. And Judith's put the questions in the chat. I, I took a screenshot and I'm sharing that as well. Perfect. And um, <clears throat> does everybody know what FAIR principles are? I'm familiar with that. And you did, um, yes, just had a share about XMind, and I just looked that up. That's a really cool software, it's a um, open access software for mind mapping and brainstorming. Oh, awesome! It's not something I'm familiar with. That's, that's great. Maybe we can share that in the plenary as well. Yeah, maybe, maybe somebody can make a mind map in that, whoever shared it for their own project, and that can be the project to share when we go back to plenary. So that's Korea here. Awesome. He, he's well-versed. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I don't know. I haven't used it for a while, but... So you want me to make a mind map? Yes, yeah, so Graph. right now... 
Yeah, Go for ahead, 10 minutes. It. I'm sorry. For 10 minutes, think about your own project and yeah. mind map answers to these three questions. The types of data and um, the, uh, the prin FAIR principles and then um, supporting documentation and accessibility for long term. So just for your own project, 10 minutes. And then we will, as a team, you guys in this breakout room, will pick one project to share out because we don't have time to share out everyone's projects, to do it very, very quickly. Okay. That's it. Yeah, and Judith, when it looks like everybody's back, I can go ahead and get started here. We are all back. Okay, so we are all here. Excellent. Well, I popped in and out of a few breakout rooms and saw some amazing discussions going on. So again, I just wanted to thank all of you for just leaning into these activities. I know it's, it's hard sometimes over Zoom, but everybody in here has just been so great about this. So I wanted to thank you for that. Now, what we're going to do is again, you hopefully designated one person per your breakout room, just to very briefly share the results of your discussion. So what I would say here is take up to a minute just to describe the, the, uh, describe the DDOMP, describe what you mind mapped for the DDOMP. And then if you need it, take an additional minute just to talk about were there challenges to doing this? Was there anything you noticed? Is there anything you wanna add? So what we'll do is start with breakout room one. Your designated person can feel free to unmute themselves and uh, start talking. And if you need to share a screen, just let me know. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Claire. I was in breakout room number one and drew the short straw. So here's my quite cluttered mind map. Um, I'll hold it up for a little bit longer. Um, well, we're working on a project on climate change and urban food, water and energy nexus. Um, and our project's got three main components, at least that my part of the team is working on. So we've got information about food, water, energy, information about the urban areas that we're working in, and also information from our stakeholders. Um, so I've tried to sort of map out the data um, sets that we're collecting. Some of it's very quantitative, so population growth, footfall in certain areas, water use, energy use. Some of it will be third party, like climate data, weather data. Some of it will be GIS data, architectural drawings, Google Earth files, photos, drone footage, all sorts of fun. Um, and we've also got stakeholder analysis. So some of that will be data mining from the municipal websites we're working with. Others will be interviews, both the audio and transcriptions, and also things with focus groups and co-creation workshops. But we'll have recordings, we'll have notes, we'll have artifacts created by the participants, we'll have photos, um, we'll probably have some architectural models at some stage. Um, we're gonna have all sorts of crazy stuff to deal with. Um, and this is what really came up in our group discussion, was partly how do we what's best practice for dealing with photos, drawings, models, drone footage, anything that's a bit out there um, and doesn't necessarily fit neatly into kind of an Excel spreadsheet or a database or kind of a text document. Um, so that was sort of one aspect. Second was what sort of best practice when you're dealing with something like a Google Earth file, which for the sake of team working and working across continents, is brilliant, but we're trying to avoid using proprietary file types. And Google kind of Google Earth files are great, but they're only as open as Google's gonna let them be. So we kind of don't really know ongoing what best practice with those is going to be. And then again, something that a few of us in the group raised was best practice with interview data, particularly where it has to be heavily anonymized. Um, and consent is only granted on the basis that it is completely unidentifiable. Um, how do we sort of store those transcripts and what do we do with them? Um, you know, when we have to tell participants that these will be shared, these will be hosted somewhere, um, kind of what assurances and best practices can we give um, with data like that? So that's kind of our key things in, yeah, breakout room one. 
Excellent. That was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. And I wrote down just some notes here as well, just to make sure that the that the handout, which is also a living document that you'll get, you know, I can add in some of these concerns and just some, okay. some resources for this. Great. Okay. Uh, breakout room two. Who was our person for that? I don't know what group I was in, but I'm the short straw. You were in two. Oh, perfect. Ah, <laughs> yes. <and one>. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we had a ghost in our team who put up a lovely mind map, but we couldn't identify who it was. So um, I'm just going to share the screen on my one, um, which was not as good as the one that had come up from the ghost. Um, is that working? Did that work, the share screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet. I, I made sure to stop sharing the screen, so hopefully you'll have access to that. Well, I'm in South Africa, so maybe it's taking a long time. Okay, <laughs> where's my mind? It's not coming out. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, I think it was user yes. interface mm -hmm. error. Okay, so that was, this was not the winner. Um, this was the, the, the one I made. Um, and it was just sort of starting to think about the different formats of the data that we would output and some would be spatial and some would be temporal and they would feed into models and the models would output scenarios so on and so forth so that was just the the exercise about thinking around that we did spend some time discussing challenges um which i think is more informative than my share screen so i'm going to unshare my screen um sorry i've got about twenty five thousand things open on my screen right now Mm. stop sharing right so our discussion went around um not so much the whole ddomp but actually how difficult it is to to get data out of your researchers that that where they actually comply with some standards that you've set for the project because nobody has time for that people have only got time to plan their research go out collect their data come back analyze their data put it in the reports give Belmont their, their, their products at the, and, and nobody wants to sit down and reformat their data or put in metadata or comply with any of these things. So that's been my challenge for 21 years is to get my teams to actually do that. And so you need to, I believe, and we believed in the group, they were, yeah, myself and Lee Hannah in the group were talking and we believe that you need permanent data management people in your team and that you need them to be funded and they need to be sustainable. It needs to be a post within your research team. It can't just be project by project. Um, and that's what we've set up and we put in our overheads to the different projects we put in for funding for that. So um, we make sure that we, and I think my data manager is actually online, Hannah, is done, Hannah Tritter and um, um, where's Victoria? I saw her as well. She's a data management expert. So these these are our, our two sort of engine people in the middle and we scrabble to keep them funded because without them we can't do our research. And I think a lot of projects and a lot of funding agencies don't understand that. And I'm glad that Belmont does understand that and makes a big deal of it. So those were the sort of the two challenges, the keeping a funded data person and then also getting your researchers to actually be good boys and girls. Excellent. Bye. Thank you so much. That is extremely informative. Yeah. How about um, group three now? It looks like Lucas is our. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we discussed a bit around my. Um, so that's my PhD project. So my my PhD is here, and it's basically three main repositories. So the second and third are just like two different methods, but to do similar things. So I just. Um, describe only one but basically the the first one is sequencing data for analyzing and and we generate pictures sequence and metadata and all of this uh, is put with a, a creative common license on, on the on the pictures and a separated DOI on the data set for for it to be publicly available and and the second part um, we, we generate big data sequences as well as environmental data. 
And so this part actually uh, gave interesting uh, discussion because um, we, we create gigabytes of data, uh, sometimes terabytes, and we don't know how to, to put them in, in public repository. Um, but yeah, th there is some information, some um, here, for example, in France, there is the, the PNDB, it's called, and uh, it gives a, a fair principle a repository for data sets. But th there is no real, um, real question about big data sets like that. And we also had another dis discussion, I will make it short, but uh, for example, for um, um, social data, uh, social data um, how can we put them uh, with permission, uh, anonymous, uh, responses or this is big issue we discussed uh, together actually yeah excellent thank you so much yeah i will definitely with the social sciences and trying to think you know how do we make this data public uh, i will be sure that the handout has a section devoted to that just an additional section again it'll be a living document okay our next group looks like group four is Florencia. Great. Okay, here we are. Uh, see, visual? visual? Okay. It's um, basically um, it represents the, the three main outputs, which would be this uh, rainfall data and social impacts. I uh, have just added a third output that I forgot when I initially <laughs> did the exercise of drawing this which is the knowledge co-production because the project um, that I'm involved in is I actually focuses on uh, rainfall data and social impacts knowledge co-produced with stakeholders. Um, so basically from um, I, I, when I did the mapping, I first uh, focused on the, the kind of information that would be produced on one side, the, 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 the meteorological information that um, that would form a database and on the social impacts which is the one that I am more involved to it, it's actually larger because it's the one I know the, the most uh, that includes um, the observations uh, I'm sorry I think I'm moving and well the observations the interviews all the documentation the surveys also the documentation from the workshops and as a result, both the rainfall data and social impacts data, as well as the knowledge co-production process uh, knowledge, uh, would be accessible through open access publications and through the project website. Uh, when we discussed it together, what we realized was that um, it's important to consider um, when it comes to social data, um, the sensibility of the data, and um, we came to the conclusion that it was important uh, to consider, for instance, the anonymization of uh, this data, for, in, for example, on the transcriptions, and to be very careful with these uh, sensitive social data. Excellent, thank you so much, great. Okay, group five, do we have our spokesperson? Hi everyone, Victoria from South Africa. Um, so we were a very quiet group. We didn't really say much. Um, so this was the one that I had put together. Um, and we had thought through a lot of this um, probably about a year and a half ago. So for me, what was quite interesting was thinking about what we'd planned to do, where have we got, um, we've implemented, um, a spatial data repository which is open source um, so hopefully moving forward um, flying into data one and Belmont should be very easy and then just thinking about the different data types some which can be handled quite easily like your CSV files your spatial data um, and then thinking about video data and um, more of the remote sensing stuff and kind of how we would um, deal with that. And a lot of what Mandy said, but she's um, our commander in chief on the project. So a lot of her ideas around permanent people time to actually getting the data out of people is such a challenge. Um, 
also bringing as we're moving more into the the sort of socio-economic research and the transdisciplinary stuff how do you deal with the different um requirements of um the different fields social data the ethics um linked to that how do you keep all multiple funders happy multiple universities um yeah so it for me it was quite um although very quiet for me personally it was a um a good time to think about what we have done and where there are opportunities to actually improve and think about the bigger picture excellent thank you so much and do we have a group six representative to to wrap us up here Hi, so this is Tomoko, and um, I'd like to share my screen, okay. if hopefully it will work. Um, so I did mine on uh, PowerPoint, and um, so from left to right, uh, these are the outputs that I've envisaged. Um, so first it's the basic data, and then the secondary data that's derived from analyzing the basic data and then the tertiary data, which is um, the metadata that comes from the secondary data as well. And I was wondering if maybe the DDOMP itself could be considered as one of the um, important outputs, the key outputs of the project. So I put that itself as an output as well. And um, in our group, um, there was a very interesting discussion towards the end where we were considering the timing for making the data public. And um, since the data itself um, is um, very relevant to our uh, academic um, publications, um, there was um, um, some discussion on whether maybe there should be a time lag between making the data public and so after the uh, the publications has have been made but unfortunately we ran out of time and just when the discussion was getting interesting um, we were kicked out of the, um, the breakout room so that was where we got to thank you Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. And I know we're at time. I have a, a single sol a solitary final slide to share here that just has um, additional information for you. And so what I would like you to do, this is again, just on your own. It's, it's more of just take this back to your project. What are three things that you know, you think are so the most important that you would want to bring back to your project team. And I am always here to answer data management questions. Uh, I'm a librarian, you know, by trade. And so that's, that's kind of my job. So I have my email here and I do want to let you know that the, the actual handout, the link is here. So when you get the slides, you'll get this link as well. That's a living document based on what you came up with today. I'm going to add some sections that address your concerns. And then there are some folks who left comments in the registration that said, I would like to learn about, you know, these different things, which we did not include in the workshop due to time constraints, but I just want to let you know, I will be in touch with you using the email that you use just to provide some resources for that. And that is the end of our workshop, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I super appreciate it. Again, please feel free to use me as a resource uh, for any data management questions you have. Erica, would you like to take a minute to, to share some words? I, I do see that you put your notes in the chat, but maybe you want to say something. Sure. I want to thank Hannah and Judith uh, for making this a possibility for all of you and just an amazing opportunity to really consider data uh, in a strategic way. Um, I did want to offer uh, to all of you who either are not going to have a project web page or uh, at the end of your project, maybe the money and time runs out and you, your project web page will close. We do have a resources page on belmontforum.org. We would be happy to host those items indefinitely. So uh, workshop reports, um, any kind of uh, documentation output or videos we can put on the YouTube channel. And uh, we'll use a different kind of metadata. We'll use tags so that uh, they are searchable, findable, accessible. So um, please do let us know at info at belmontforum.org. 
um, how we can help you um, archive your project materials. But again, thank you so much to Hannah for uh, her wonderful insights and looking forward to that living document. I'll turn it back to you, Yuta and Hannah. Thank you. And um, I do see some of you sharing um, the items that you will take back um, home. It would be also, if you have time to stick around and share with us in plenary, it would be wonderful to hear what you have found most useful from this, this project and what you think is going to be um, valuable to take back to the entire team, um, especially if you're just representing your team. Uh, feel free to um, use the little uh, raised hand tool, the little blue hand, um, or just unmute. It's, it's, I can see actually everyone's screen, so if you use the raised hand, I, I would be able to call on you, but feel free to unmute and share. And also if you have some challenges that you would want to ask right now here in plenary. Yes, um, Georg? George? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> Did you want to share? No, no, I was oh. hitting the wrong button. So. Oh, I see. Shared by accident. All right. I will lower <laughs> your hand. Sorry. No problem. Um, anyone else? We don't have to do this either. So <laughs> don't feel obligated. I, and we do see people signing off. Um, Hannah, do you have any closing words? Um, not necessarily anything right now. Just, uh, yeah, people can definitely feel free to contact me. And the, the handout right now is, is pretty extensive. So when you get the slides, you'll have the link to that as well. And again, that's a living document, just like the DDOMP should be. <laughs> and so based on the things I learned during this workshop from all of you, I'll, I'll keep adding to that document. If you ever have something that you'd like to see in there, you can feel free to email me too. And for, for those of you who are still around, I'm going to let you know that I will write a follow-up email um, to everyone, and I will ask for a contribution of some homework. I will ask for you to update your DDOMP based on, on what you learned here or what you're finding in the resources, and it would be wonderful for us to, to have a response back from you on, um, with an updated plan. And uh, this can be just a continued back and forth uh, for the next couple of months and we'll be happy to help you. Um, and it would be also really good to, to use that scorecard and the criteria and you can um, check your own work or you can ask us to score it for you. It's, it's, um, it's, an, it's a risk-free exercise and it's a service that we are uh, very happy to provide for you. Um, Thank you for mentioning that. I remember towards the end, I was like, oh no, I'm running out of time. So hopefully folks can get that information. So that's great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we have some take back messages here. Excellent. So ste the steps in data management, do's and don'ts, Belmont Forum resources, and then a go-to person for future data questions. Great. Excellent. Okay, so we see some folks signing off, but I, I do want to call out for um, Wael and Riham. Riham, if you want to. Yes. Uh, yes. Hey, how are you? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I, I, uh, my, my, my angle for the session is totally different than the remaining of uh, the peers here. Uh, I'm looking for the uh, funding agency perspective. So I have some questions related to the data. Erica uh, offered that she can uh, store the data of the websites of the project that has been ended or uh, no longer has have fund. Uh, my question here, uh, how, how could you manage different type of websites? Website has different technology, has different uh, capacity, has different size of data. How you could manage this? 
So I, it, the offer is not so much to archive the website itself, but archive the content from the website. Um, so we maintain project pages and we're actually going to be amplifying the project pages to contain more content. But many of the, the project pages um, external to Belmont Forum, you know, have workshop reports or have, um, you know, blog entries and things like this. And what we can do is take that content into uh, the Belmont Forum resource page and make sure we tag it appropriately. Um, so what many people probably don't know is when you come to belmontforum.org, we do have a search capability. For example, if you wanted to find all of the work that was going on and all of the resources for Greenland, you can type Greenland in the uh, search bar and you'll get that list. So, so you're offering the, the, the storing the content only of the website. So whoever had the website have to extract the content from this website and they give it to you in a format as a text. Not, uh, will not give you as a, as a workable website. You will not host the, work, the, the website in your site. Right? We can host um, different elements. I mean, I think it's on a case by case basis, but imagery we can handle. We can handle video through our YouTube channel. Um, so just from the experience of visiting our project web pages to learn more about the projects, um, a lot of them use WordPress or other uh, tools like that, and it's it's primarily an uploaded files or um, or posts. So we're not moving into like high volume terabyte data sets or um, complex so, models. Okay, this is my next question. What if the website is also having that uh, big data, big volume of data, satellite data, uh, something like this? How, how you could manage or you do not offer something like this? I, I think we'd need to work with that team. I used to work with satellite data a lot. I know um, the issues with that, but there are appropriate and more accessible archives in Belmont Forum for satellite mm. data. So I think um, part of the DDOMP process is really identifying effective, accessible uh, areas and using that scorecard to determine that. Um, because if you're archiving your data extremely well, but in a place nobody looks for it, mm -hmm. then you're not going to get that added value. You're not exactly. going to get the, the reuse and the citation of your data set, which now contributes to um, career advancement in a lot of uh, university systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is uh, any, uh, enough for uh, for now. But I think we'll uh, we need more discussion because we need go, we need to go in the implementation uh, plan how we can work with these uh, issues. Thank you, thank you very much, Erica. Thank you, uh, Jody. That is a very nice workshop, and we'll talk later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love the comment in the chat. Um, Lydia, hopefully I said that correctly. Yeah, it's, Judah and I were saying this yesterday. It's like, we never learn this stuff early enough. <laughs> it's always, I wish I had known this stuff when I started my PhD. It's always, whenever it happens is good, but the earlier, the better. <laughs> Even even if it if it is after two years of project, uh, I think that we can implement some some uh, tips exactly. to uh, to make progress and for um, future projects as well. It's it's very useful knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it.